Welcome to Chainlink Research Reports. Today we're joined by Dr. Kristen Costa Kinney, who is an assistant professor at the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy at the Baylor College of Medicine. As a bioethicist and a medical anthropologist, Dr. Costa Kinney's research focuses on ethical and cultural issues surrounding the use of biotechnology and artificial intelligence in healthcare. Today she'll be speaking with us about one of her recent papers published in the journal Science entitled, How NFTs Can Transform Health Information Exchange. The paper argues that NFTs or NFT-like frameworks along with smart contracts can help incentivize a more democratized, transparent and efficient system for health information exchange in which patients participate in decisions about how and with whom their private health information is shared. And now, Dr. Costa Kinney. Kristen, great to have you here. Thank you very much, Jason. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to talk a little bit more about um, the promises and perils maybe of using NFTs or more specifically um, smart contracts for health information exchange. You can see my screen now. Okay, great. Um, so this talk is based on um, an article we published in um, in Science this February. Um, I say we because uh, ideas in this paper are not just mine. They're also those of my colleagues and co-authors on the paper. Um, and between all of us, our expertise is really in the fields of bioethics and health law and um, health information exchange systems and my background, uh, medical anthropology and bioethics and social science. So um, while these esteemed folks were really instrumental in helping to think through some of the ideas uh, that I'll mention today, um, I'll just say a disclaimer that all, you know, whatever I say today here, it's uh, I'm speaking only for myself. So they're off the hook. Um, so we were motivated to write this article mainly to address what we see as a longstanding and um, growing problem actually in the, in the world of health information exchange, which is that the average person, uh, probably you, Jason, and probably me too um, included, have no idea where our health data is going, um, who's using it, and for what purposes. And it might come as some surprise to people that our pers personal health information is shared really extensively without our knowledge and consent. Um, and in some cases, this is done illegally, right? So through security breaches and through other un unauthorized forms of sharing. But there's also this entirely legal marketplace for sharing personal and sometimes highly sensitive um, personal health data. So you might think, well, that's just fine because HIPAA laws in the US say that um, all those data have to be ID identified anyway before they're shared. So nobody can tell if it's actually me with a particular disease or a psychiatric condition or drug history or what have you. And you might also think that this, all this data is being exchanged for good benevolent purposes um, to increase healthcare innovation, you know, improve public health, advanced genomics, risk prediction, AI, things like that. Um, and while it is true that a lot of our data is shared in service of these big kind of global health challenges, um, these transactions are only just a fraction of the kinds of data sharing happening right now in the health information exchange marketplace. So in reality, there's this whole industry out there, you guys already know about it, I'm sure, um, that has cropped up with the primary, primary aim of re-identifying your personal health information in increasingly sophisticated ways. So by triangulating your health information with information that you put on other platforms, you know, uh, other devices, marketers can build this, this broader profile of you, your job, your interests, your health status, your disabilities. And as you can imagine, and of course, as many um, people already working in tech already know, um, this kind of profiling is very easily monetized and wildly, wildly profitable. Um, but, oh, sorry, just go back. Uh, but HIPAA, you know, this piece of legislation that was passed like in 1996 um, hasn't been updated in like almost the past two decades uh, to be able to handle these new te technological capabilities that make re-identification re pretty darn easy. Um, sometimes even, even just using like a couple data points. Um, even a few seconds recording of your voice, for example, can be part of your digital footprint or the breadcrumbs or whatever metaphor you want to use that leads back to your identity online. 
Um, and so health data, as health data continues to be more granular and more personalized, anything from radiological imaging to heart rate information to brain activity to your sleep patterns, I mean, you name it, could lead back to you very easily. Um, and when you put all these things together into a package, it's really a treasure trove of personalized information. And the limits of what you can do with this information are um, open-ended. And so it should come as no surprise, you know, that the, uh, a lot of health information ex exchange is driven by profits and marketing. Um, and just as an example of this, maybe some of you noticed earlier this year that IBM just sold this decades old database that contains personal health information on um, 270 million Americans, which is just a, about over 80% of the country's population. Um, and that database was originally intended to power IBM Watson, um, but they sold it in February, this past February to an investment firm, which presumably intends to make lots of money on it. Um, and you would think that this would have made a bigger splash in, uh, in the media, um, considering we're all, most of us are, are contained in this database, but most people never even took note of it. Um, and so this is even despite that the original creator of the database, a guy named Ernie Ludi, um, who you know, owned this, he's not associated with it anymore, but he sounded this kind of quiet alarm about the privacy implications of the sale. Um, and so just one more example of this, I'll move on, uh, but I think it's just important for context um, to establish really the importance of this use case. Um, so the American Medical Association, which I had um, kind of always maybe na naively um, assumed was full of doctors who act benevol benevolently by default, sold certain physician data to pharmaceutical companies that allowed those companies to match physicians to their prescribing data collected by pharmacies. And one of those pharmacy companies, um, one of those pharma companies, sorry, is um, you know a company you might recognize, Purdue Pharma, which produced OxyContin, was officially charged in court for sowing the seeds of the opioid crisis through, among many other means, encouraging doctors to overprescribe. Um, but the point here is that by triangulating data in this way, they were able to identify these so-called soft targets of high prescribers of pain meds um, and therefore prey on patients through their doctors. So this is just to say um, that all types of medical data, including prescriptions, you know, seemingly innocuous, are powerful, um, even if it's not directly linked to the patient. It's the, indirectly through, through your, you know, your doctor. So, um, and as we've seen with opioid crisis, it, this can be, you know, even deadly if put in the wrong hands. So, but interestingly enough, it wasn't this data triangulation and exploitation that was ultimately considered to be illegal. Um, in fact, the Supreme Court ruled in another high profile case in Vermont um, that it's unconstitutional to prohibit the sale, disclosure, or use of records that reveal the prescribing practices of individual doctors, because such a prohibition um, violates the First Amendment right to free speech. So the short version of the story is that our current laws and our regulations, including HIPAA protections um, and uh, FTC regulations, they don't support patient privacy in ways that would limit um, big corporations and other entities from accessing, using, and sometimes exploiting sensitive health information in ways that aren't directly intended to benefit patients. Um, and of course, that's what I'm interested in being a bioethicist, right? And as bioethicists, uh, legal scholars, and specialists in patient-centered health information systems, um, we saw this as an ethical problem worth addressing. So um, given that the legal code is kind of slow moving um, and doesn't offer many options for recourse in this area, we published this paper as a kind of call to consider the potentials of using smart contracts um, to fill these gaps and help individuals to regain some control over their health information. And we considered the so-called craze uh, surrounding NFTs this past year, um, you know, enthusiasm about NFTs, let's say, to offer some kind of momentum to help draw attention to this idea, um, but also we recognize the need to separate serious scientific inquiry into the potentials of NFTs from all the hype that surrounds it, of course. Um, so while science was pretty firm about us keeping the term NFT in the title of our paper, what we really aimed to focus on was the potential benefits and also the complex challenges of using smart contracts to ensure that patients, um, you know, rather than this small set of powerful players in the health information exchange marketplace, 
patients are the ones that sent the terms in, uh, uh, for transactions involving their data. So the main points we tried to get across in this paper were that people, or rather um, institutions uh, like hospitals, EHR companies, research institutions um, that currently act as data stewards or data trusts, um, could use smart contracts to grant selective permission to patient data and to transparently track those transactions. So not store the data in a blockchain or anything like that. That's a common misunderstanding of what we proposed, but to just to track the transactions. Um, and this would have the benefits of improved transparency, helping to identify and prevent um, unwanted actors from accessing you know, personal data, enhance the overall efficiency even of good transactions like those involving scientific researchers and medical institutions or even companies trying to innovate healthcare solutions. Um, and then the data requesters could benefit from easy verification of the authenticity and provenance of the health data and a more kind of streamlined, transparent procurement procedure. And there's a lot of red tape involved in that right now. So that is a, is a big plus too. So, and then there's also the idea that um, smart contracts could help with indexing, you know, through their nature as metadata. So they could help to categorize and analyze data. And then um, from an ethical perspective, you know, almost maybe most importantly, um, smart contracts could be used to help patients consent in advance or prosent uh, a term from um, Sebastian Mann and Savalescu. Um, to kind of prosent in advance to certain data sharing scenarios that align with their values and their preferences. Um, and the terms of these contracts can be highly granular, I mean, theoretically speaking, <laughs> and personalized. Um, so the idea behind this whole arrangement is that data exchange decisions are patient-centered, um, which is an ethos that guides a lot of the research in bioethics at Baylor, where I am at, and also elsewhere. And But the thing about this ethos is that it's not you know, it's just only one part of a, mar a much larger set of moving pieces that together make up a pretty complex world of health information exchange and integrating patient-centered smart contracts is kind of just a pipe dream if you don't have the support of integrated social, legal, and technological infrastructure and ecosystem to support it, um, including buy-in from the major players that, you know, keep the marketplace turning around. Um, and one thing you'll notice is that the patient is not at the center of this marketplace, not by a long shot, at least not right now. So what do we need to do to bring patient interest more to the center? Um, one of the things I look at in my work, especially as it relates to building ethics into AI and machine learning systems for healthcare and decision support, clinical decision support, is how to embed human values directly into the computational parameters of a given system. Um, so in our work around personalized risk calculators, we look at what patients want to know, um, like what's meaningful to them, what physicians think they need to know. Um, and then we try to build this information and these values into the systems in terms of metrics and parameters. Um, and then how also how its inputs, how, sorry, how its outputs are communicated to patients. So you might recognize this kind of value sensitive design approach from the fields of robotics. And um, like I said, AI more recently, and this is Batia Freeman who pioneered this idea. Um, and in some ways you could argue that value sensitive design is already embedded into the kind of decentralized democratized ethos uh, that motivates blockchain technology and smart contracts and web three, um, which is what draws a lot of people to it. Um, but when we're talking about designing, not just a technology, but a technology and a social, a, tech, a technology um, and a technological and social ecosystem, uh, we have to think about how we build value build the value of patient privacy, not only into the design features and the specific terms of smart contracts, but how we want to position them within this larger um, system itself. So how do you do that? <laughs> that is the question. Um, so one of the things that um, you need to do, at least, you know, uh, from my thinking about this is you need to satisfy not just patient goals and values, but everyone else's as well. Um, as, and, you know, because nobody, especially not the powerful players that, that I mentioned before, nobody's going to relinquish control over a system that generates the kind of profits that we're talking about here. So smart contracts have to allow everyone to get a piece of the pie. Otherwise, they're just never going to get off the ground, um, at least not in the health information ecosystem. 
So you can't, for example, just give patients sole ownership over their data um, because data ownership in healthcare is way more complicated than that. Um, and that's something we talk about in our paper. So instead, you know, attaching a smart contract to a patient's PHI, personal health information, has to result from a consensus, a larger consensus among multiple stakeholders. Um, not only the data subjects, you know, the patients, uh, which I think is what Web3 focuses on. A lot of the companies focus it, focusing on NFTs for healthcare are, focus, are focused on the patients. But the people who generate your medical data, um, like doctors, hospitals, um, even device and pharmaceutical companies, um, people involved in creating the kind of sophisticated technologies that you know, are being used to collect those data in the first place. Um, and then those people who store your data, those, those entities that store your data. So hospitals, biobanks, electronic health record companies, you know, all of these people are going to want a piece of the pie and, and arguably have some stake in this, right? So getting buy-in from all these stakeholders means that you have to set up smart contracts in a way um, that's mutually beneficial for all these parties involved. And you have to kind of divorce the idea of smart contracts as designating ownership in the traditional sense of the word. Um, just because they, they can limit access on a computational level doesn't mean that smart contracts reflect um, underlying laws or understandings of who owns what. So, um, and trying to find some common ground across you know, these diverse stakeholders while maintaining a, an emphasis on patient rights and privacy is a real challenge. So this is one of the things that I focus on um, from an ethical and social science perspective um, and what Helena Hapio called the, the kind of human side of smart contracts. So the idea is that um, to create this kind of frictionless system, you know, where nobody's too upset about it, <laughs> um, you need not just technologists and, and coders and, and uh, systems designers, but also people from disciplines like medical anthropology, I'm biased, of course, um, but other social sciences as well. You know, you need, um, you need ethicists, you need legal scholars, uh, maybe even cognitive and decision scientists who can help predict how people are going to react to democratizing control over health data in this way, because maybe it's not going to be as peachy as we like to think it's going to be. Um, because, for example, there's already a ton of research on patient consent that shows patients don't really know what to do with this power. Um, once you give it to them. Um, and if we look at how patients respond to new consent models that emerge alongside biobanks and the emergence of big data approaches like um, broad and dynamic consent where people can, can kind of selectively update their consent preferences over time through apps and stuff like you see here. Um, it turns out that these kinds of consent models can put burden on individuals who really don't have the expertise or knowledge or time um, to make informed decisions about who they want to share their data with. Um, so, you know, I think we need to explore other models of informed consent that reduce the decisional burdens, uh, but still allow patients granular control if and when they want it. Um, and another important and related cultural piece of this is that, you know, if we're going to design this technology to help protect patients' data privacy, we have to make sure that this is something that they even care about. Uh, and my view is that most people don't care enough about privacy, um, especially young people, <laughs> um, but everybody, I think, because they don't really, you know, they lack a certain awareness of what people can do with those, those personal data, um, you know, uh, what people who can do who don't necessarily have our best interests at heart. And, even after things like Cambridge Analytica, um, there's still not a strong consensus that um, data privacy is a big threat to autonomy and well being. Um, so, that is something to be addressed. So, those are, those are issues for um, social scientists to figure out. But probably the things that you know, your audience um, is most interested in is the kind of technological frameworks needed to support smart contracts for this kind of use case. Um, and one of the most important things that I think is needed is this ecosystem of trustworthy data feeds into these patient-led smart contracts. Um, of course, this is something you know that Chainlink and other Oracle network companies know a thing or two about. Um, also, I borrowed your nice graphics. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, but um, so we need to be able to gather information um, that's going to reliably tell us what um, whether data requesters are who they say they are, and if they're requesting data for for the purposes that they claim to be. 
Um, and then it's also useful to know if there's any substantial conflicts of interest, um, which most academic institutions collect those data. So, you know, you can know whether data um, requesters have affiliations or alliances with industry or other entities that might indicate that they're collecting data on, um, on behalf of other actors. And then, um, of course, you'd have to feed in information about what patients' preferences actually are, uh, what they're consenting to in terms of data sharing. Um, so that comes from clinical tri trial consent agreements, uh, patient intake forms, other places where patient data sharing preferences are documented. Um, and then all of this should be updated in a, in a dynamic way, um, using dynamic NFTs, perhaps. So another important piece, uh, finally, <laughs> that I'll talk about here is, is the need to make sure that the technological environment can actually feasibly support the intended privacy functions of smart contracts. And this means that we need better uh, data, data storage standards um, across the board to ensure that health information is properly encrypted and less susceptible to data breach. Um, that might seem really obvious, but data breaches are still so common in the healthcare industry and every year outpaces the last in terms of the number of data breaches. And contrary to, to what some people may think about smart contracts, linking, to, linking smart contracts to insecurely stored data is not going to make uh, those data more secure. I know I'm speaking to the choir here, you guys know this, but a lot of people don't know that. Um, so we need to better protect the data wherever it is through encrypted or decentralized storage or whatever is the best fit for a particular corpus of data. Um, but one challenge is that data protections aren't likely to be equitable across the board. You know, we're talking from an ethical perspective here. Um, in this picture, you see a big biobank in the middle here, uh, which probably has pretty strong data encryption, but you can imagine that lower resourced hospitals and clinics, and even, you know, individual researchers, some people are storing this stuff on their computers, you know, um, uh, they might have a harder time securing their databases, and, you know, uh, and that can put certain communities at greater risk for data breach and exploitation, um, which is, of course, another problem for social scientists to figure out in, in uh, conjunction with technologists. So the last part of this technological environment that I view as essential is to make sure that data isn't duplicated once it's accessed by an authenticated data requester. Um, and that's really hard to do because, you know, once people have access, what's to stop them from just endlessly duplicating and reselling your data? And some people limit the time that you have access to the data, but as technology advances, you're going to be able to download it, you know, more quickly. Um, so that's going to be, that's the time lapse is, is a temporary solution, I think. Um, and then you'll remember this is one of the first head scratchers when NFTs came on the scene. People were just like, why? Why NFT a JPEG when you can just copy and paste it everywhere? You know, it doesn't make any sense. So, I mean, now we have a, a bit more sophisticated idea of why that's valuable, um, I hope. But um, we don't want people doing that with health data, right? So the, the one way to avoid this is by never letting anyone take the data with them at all. So the data never leaves its secure data storage spot. Um, and using emerging technologies like federated machine learning, smart contracts could be set up to allow algorithms instead of people to access the data and to return relevant representations or summaries of those data to the data requesters without them ever having to lay their human eyes on the data itself. So that's something uh, I'm really um, looking into as well. So in this sense, um, integrating smart contracts as privacy by design tools has the potential not only to kind of nudge patients closer to the center of data sharing decisions, but also I hope to act as a kind of catalyst for modernizing the system as a whole. Um, and we have this growing capacity to bring together advancements in encryption, um, blockchain, smart contracts, federated learning, um, dynamic consent approaches, which really smart people are working on in ways that better serve patients. I mean, a lot of people are working on these separate pieces. We just need to, you know, bring them all together. Um, and then, you know, even our legal understandings of ownership and contract law, for example, they're already being modernized in important ways by the integration of smart contracts. And you can see this um, in the case for NFTs for art and real estate and, and so on. So in my view, all of this doesn't undermine the, you know, the essential profitability of health information exchange. It just shifts those profits 
to developers of more patient-centered and value-sensitive um, technologies. Um, instead of powerful companies and other entities who are just trying to exploit people's health needs for their own gain. And from an ethical perspective, that seems like a pretty good deal. Um, and uh, people are already on top of this. You know, we're definitely not the only ones thinking about this, uh, luckily. So most of the action in this area is um, uh, in the world of genomics. Um, so the first, that's the first field where scientific and medical discoveries really started to depend on these large aggregated data sets and incentivizing people to share their data. Uh, so here are some companies that you see here, um, also some others that are working on incentivizing people to share their data using blockchain approaches. Um, but all these companies, to my knowledge, I may be wrong, uh, because they're changing sort of every day, right? <laughs> they're evolving really at a fast pace. Um, I think that they still involve data aggregation, which still carries the problems of data duplication and data egress that I mentioned before. Um, and not many people are thinking yet about how to integrate blockchain with federated learning yet. With the exception of um, Oaken, which I think is a pretty impressive company that uses both federated learning and blockchain to help researchers explore questions related to um, especially per personalized medicine while protecting uh, patient privacy. And then there's other companies like iMedis, Engine, RightsHash, um, and probably some others. I, I apologize to anybody that I'm missing out here. Um, but um, I think the goal of those companies are to mint people's health, certain aspects of people's health data into NFTs to send, send, with their, send to their doctors and to track um, and manage patient consent for clinical trials. So those are really interesting. Um, definitely keeping, keeping my eye on those and hopefully others are too. Um, so the good thing is that people are catching on to all this and that there's, you know, there's some hope that the public interest surrounding NFTs will help to just some raise, raise some awareness about the importance of privacy and control over personal data. Uh, I think that's an ethos that's just really carried along with the whole idea of NFTs. Um, you'll probably recall last year that George Church, the Harvard professor who found it, helped to found uh, Nebula, made a big media splash by minting his genome um, into an NFT and putting it up for sale. And he did that because he was trying to show um, that people can monetize their data and then maybe they would be more incentivized to, to share it. And then, you know, that would therefore amp up the pace of scientific uh, discovery. So that was kind of a cool strategy to get people thinking more about data as theirs, you know? Um, I do think that we need to put careful thought into how we frame public perspectives towards smart contracts. Um, and this is sort of my last slide and, and point. Um, how we frame public perspectives towards smart contracts and blockchain and Web3 and kind of the larger ethos of de decentralization in healthcare in particular, but arguably beyond. Um, I think at this point, we have a chance in these early days to be um, choice architects, uh, to borrow a term from behavioral economics. It sounds nefarious, but it's really not. Um, but to be, to, to kind of think about the, the kind of choice architecture, like what people are deciding amongst um, in ways that positively influence public perceptions and expectations of these technologies for a greater good. Um, and I think the goal is not necessarily to get people to see their health data as a big moneymaker, but more to kind of view smart contracts as one part of a, a system that's redesigned, that needs to be redesigned for a more ethical and equitable balance of power and a way for people to participate willingly, willingly, you know, not um, without their consent or awareness in innovation and discovery. So thank you very much. This is where you can contact me. I definitely welcome uh, any questions or comments. So Jason, I'll turn it over to you. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Kristen, for that really fascinating presentation and for this really excellent paper that uh, I had the uh, had the pleasure of reading. Uh, so I have a couple of questions for you that um, I hope we can engage in a, in a conversation with. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think there's there's so much to talk about here, but I'm going to try to keep it as focused as possible. <laughs> um, so. You know, the first thing I'd like to start off with is just a, a question about what brought you to this space, this crypto space and the kind of NFT and smart contract space. Um, how did you go from a kind of medical anthropologist and a bioethicist uh, to someone who became interested in, in blockchain and, and this kind of area? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I blame my husband, actually. <laughs> uh, he's a big 
I, I would say crypto enthusiast, but he's really interested in it. Um, and but he's interested in it from a more um, you know, economic perspective. So he's following cryptocurrencies and things like that. And then I remember one night he told me about NFTs and, you know, I probably had the same reaction as, as most people. Um, and I kind of mentioned it here. It's like, I, I just could not understand why this was valuable and why people were making, you know, putting tons and tons of money into it. And so that really spurred kind of an intellectual curiosity. So I started listening to all these, you know, crypto podcast while I was running, <laughs> you know, just trying to understand the world, just trying to get a, a, a foray into this world. And, um, and so I ended up thinking a lot more about NFTs and the more I researched about them, I just kind of got hooked because I, I, the more I started to learn about um, smart contracts as a kind of technology uh, that um, called into dispute ownership, you know, um, and kind of revolutionize the way we're thinking about ownership and licensing and um, profits and things like that. I mean, that to me was a, a kind of intellectual hook and just being in healthcare, I just by default started, started applying it to issues of data privacy and data security that I was already familiar with and that we so far haven't found any great solutions for. So, I'm really interested in this idea about informed consent that you discussed, because that's a, a big problem. Of course, it's fraught with a lot of ethical uh, you know, difficulties and issues. And I think we all have experiences where we've consented to something, to sharing data, and we actually have no idea what we've consented to. Right. I mean, like when you buy an iPhone or if you kind of purchase any product and you have to and you consent to share your information, you're usually may like met with this giant document <laughs> where, you know, it would, it would you would need like a, a team of lawyers to break it down to you and to help you understand it in a in a more uh, comprehensive way. So um, so, you know, th this Conform consent, as you mentioned, it creates what we would call in kind of political science and public administration, um, these administrative burdens that people have to overcome in order to be able to even understand what it is that they're consenting to, right? Mm -hmm. and I think this is the biggest problem that, that they, at least the biggest ethical issue that uh, is facing uh, the idea of fair informed consent. So, uh, one thing I was I was really curious about was was hearing your opinion about whether you think smart contracts or NFTs might have a role in uh, in improving informed consent in terms of reducing this administrative burden on people so that they understand what it is that they're consenting to and there's not this kind of asymmetric relationship where you have on the one side a giant agreement that no one understands. And on the other side, a person who's just consenting to it because they wanna access the product or they wanna, <clears throat> they wanna collect some, uh, some kind of uh, reward or something. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, do, do you think there, that there is a role for smart, smart contracts and NSTs in, in terms of helping people understand what it is that they're consenting to and reducing this administrative burden? No. I don't think so. Um, I what I I think that consent, the world of consent, is tricky, and I think that it does place a lot of cognitive burden on people, like you mentioned. And I think that that's a problem that needs to be sorted out by um, you know smart social scientists. Um, I don't think I think the primary utility of smart contracts is to be the messenger for the you know the automated executor of those preferences. I don't think they. I wish they could you know um, help with the the tricky you know tangly problems of, of informed consent. But the primary issues of informed consent, as you mentioned, is the just informational burden. You know, it's it's cognitive burden, informational burden, lack of understanding, lack of background. And we can't expect people to have an understanding of these types of things. I mean, even for us uh, who are in academia and have a bit more familiarity with these topics, there's still something, it's like you have to be specialized in this stuff. So smart contracts, I don't view as being able to help understand the the, um, under, help people to understand and be more informed. But I do think it gives them the opportunity to, um, and almost the incentive, if they know that their, their um, preferences are being documented and automatically executed 
That's pretty powerful. And I think that that's something that people, I mean, once we all sort out how to do the system, you know, how to actually make the stuff work, I think that that would be really incentivizing for people to maybe reflect a little bit more because right now it's still kind of nebulous what happens to their informed consent preferences once they write it down on a piece of paper or wherever. So, um, since you're a, a bioethicist and you work on ethical issues, I'd really like to kind of pick your, <clears throat> pick your brain about um, some of the ethical issues that I don't really see discussed as much in this, this literature about, um, you know, particularly with NFTs about monetizing private health information and things like people's genomes as, as uh, Professor Church has, uh, has done. Um, so I, I just have a general question for you in this area. And, you know, I know it's, it's, if it's, if it's too much to, if, if, if it's too big of a question, um, you know, <laughs> feel, feel free to pass. But like, the question really is, is, you know, do you, there's, there's, I, I can't quite put my finger on it. But I, I believe that there, there may be some ethical issues surrounding the ability, even the ability of people to monetize and um, to distribute their personal health information and personal data or, and or genomes, right? Um, and I was hoping maybe that <laughs> if, if you've thought about this, if you might, if you might um, kind of if you might kind of like help me understand what what ethical issues could potentially arise as a result of of this, which of course, as a result of people being able to monetize their health data and mm -hmm. their uh, and you know genomes and biological data through NFTs and smart smart contracts and blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, about some of the ethical issues that might arise and. And you know, perhaps even how we can avoid some of those problems. Yeah, um, I I know you probably heard of this term called the digital divide, right? So the idea that um, people from less resourced communities um, have a harder time finding access to technologies in the same way that people, you know, more affluent ind individuals do. So that means that they reap the benefits of of technologies less, right? So. Um, you can extrapolate that to this use case as well. The idea that let's say that you can monetize your health data through NFTs. Um, first of all, you have to know what the heck an NFT is. I'm not saying more affluent people have any better understanding because I'm not sure that that's the case. But let's say that they have access to technologies or whatever, even have access to disposable income to just explore what the heck they are, you know, um, I think that that's something that uh, can be a real problem because if 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 NFTs are being used, it, let, let's say people are able to use um, to to mint their genomes or whatever kind of health information as NFTs and be able to reap a profit off of it, it becomes highly incentivizing for people who know how to do that. Then people who know how to do that are the ones who is, who are going to be contained in those data sets, you know. Uh, and if they end up being shared with you know Nebula and all these uh, other companies that are incentivizing people to do this. Um, so that skews the data, right? So I think a big, huge issue in ethics and AI and machine learning and, and big data is the quality of data sets and non-bias in data sets. And so if you have a bunch of data sets that are purely, um, not purely, but are over-representing certain demographics who have access to NFTs, you know, and that kind of technology to be able to, to kind of channel their health data into those data sets, then any, any kind of conclusions that are wrought from those data sets is liable to be biased um, in, in a way that probably is gonna disadvantage, um, you know, community, less, less resourced communities who aren't able to have that same understanding or access or interest in NFTs. That's the first thing off the top of my head though. Yeah, no, that, that's very interesting. So in, in a way, a kind of, it, it almost relates to this idea of informed consent as well, right? Um, yeah, that's that, that, that's very interesting. Uh, yeah, because you can't be you can't really consent unless you're informed. And then who are the people who are actually informed? <laughs> so. Absolutely. So, with with that being said, do you think that from your research, uh, you know that that in the future, perhaps either in the near future or in the more distant future, 
that we're going to see a, a, a kind of more uh, ubiquitous use of NFTs and smart contracts in healthcare and specifically uh, within health information exchange systems. Um, Um, I I hope so. That's what we're hoping. But I think the the you know the main thing that we're sort of I say we you know me and, the, and my co-authors of course um, are trying to point out is that the you know smart contracts aren't a standalone technology, so um, they have to be integrated within this larger system that is already in place. And this 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 system is in place for a reason, you know, because it's making certain people money, a lot of money, and um, you know, that system is, isn't going to break down just because a, a few nifty startups and, and some ideological developers, uh, you know, say they have a new technology. Um, so I think it needs to be well thought out and well framed in ways that, you know, uh, can can be aware of and and help people fulfill their their goals, you know, from multiple different perspectives. And um, not extract that kind of incentive motive, uh, uh, that kind of profit motive, sorry, but, um, but kind of reposition it and <laughs> hopefully for the greater good, right? But uh, to answer your question, I, I, I do think that um, they can be, but I just think that a, pe a lot of pieces need to come together before that's going to come to fruition. So, and that's the thing I'm really interested in is how to bring all these pieces together. So, I mean, I'm kind of channeling my old... Um, you know, uh, um, education and, and anthropology, you know, thinking about systems like how economic systems were, you know, uh, correlated with kinship systems and all these kinds of um, cultural systems that were all kind of working together to support a cultural idiom, you know, a single cultural idiom. And I think that NFTs can be a kind of cultural idiom and a cultural tool. Um, but a lot of stuff has to happen around that, you know, in the legal sphere, technological sphere and, and things like that. So those are the things that we tried to point out in that, in that paper. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so that's pretty much all the questions I have for, for, for today. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kostik Kade for joining us on Chain and Research Reports and have a great day. Thank appreciate you, Jason. I appreciate it. Yeah, this was a pleasure. Thanks so much.